Hi guys and welcome to Autism Journeys Radio Show. Today I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Professor Olga Bob Dushima. She is one of the foremost minds in the field of sensory perceptual issues, along with many other fields. Olga, thank you so, so much for coming oh, on the show today. Thank you, Sharon, for inviting me. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose just before we start, Olga, I'll just let people know that um, uh, I suppose in keeping with the ethos, uh, Autism Journeys ethos, today we're going to use language that will be respectful of everybody in the autism conversation. So we're going to use terms like autistic and person with autism mm -hmm. interchangeably just to be respectful of, of um, the use of language dependent upon where we're living and so on and so forth. So is that okay with you, Olga? Of course, yes. Perfect, perfect. So I'm going to get right started to it because I've got a fortune of questions for you. I could have you on for a day, never mind, <laughs> never mind the short I will be speaking. So Olga, your first question is, how, what, how did you initially or why did you de initially decide to start working in the area of autism? Oh, actually I didn't. I didn't decide. It's life decided for me, you know. Uh, I never heard about autism until 1990s, uh, after my son was born. He was born in uh, 1988, he's 32 now. And uh, you see how I see it, I, I have two lives. In my past life, I was professor, university professor, the head of the department, Germanic languages, by the way, and uh, lecturing and very happy uh, linguist, if you like, right? It's uh, linguistics was my first uh, subject. But then my son was born and everything changed. My second life started. And uh, it's very different. It's very different because my, my son wasn't diagnosed with autism at the time. You can imagine it was 1991 when he was diagnosed. He was not three yet. And uh, we lived in Ukraine. Uh, because I was invited to work there for 10 years. I lived there and he wasn't diagnosed with autism because psychiatrists there never heard, like me, never heard about it. At the age of two and a half, he was diagnosed with, I will use politically incorrect language, but that's what was used at the time. He was diagnosed with severe mental retardation okay. and wait for it, schizophrenia. At the age of two and a half, right? How could I, um, you know, for me, I decided no, no, this is absolutely wrong. It cannot be this. And I started looking for specialists who could sort of tell me what was going on. And I couldn't find it in that country. But I was lucky because, see, I worked in the University of Foreign Languages. As I said, the Department of Germanic Languages. And one of the visitors was an American psychiatrist. And he looked at my son. He came to, to see me. And he said, look, it's classic autism. This is the first time I heard about it. And you know what happened next? Many friends from abroad started sending me articles, books, information. At the time, I had no computer or anything, no Google. And I started studying autism. I do remember the first time when I received this book about autism. And I was reading it at night. I was crying all night while reading it. You know why? Because I was happy. Okay. I recognized my son on every page. I was happy that I knew the name of his condition. For me, it wasn't good or bad. No, even now, for me, autism is something neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's just sort of, you know, both. Like non-autism is also both, right? There are good things and bad things. I was happy to know the name. It helped me to start researching autism. And as I said, I got a lot of information from America, from, from Britain, from Europe. And I was lucky that I had no sort of education in autism at the time, because there are different schools in America, it is a bit different than in Britain, right? Perspective on autism in Europe. So I was lucky, I could analyze and compare the schools. And I do remember I was reading this uh, about theory of mind and uh, weak central coherence and whatever. 
And I thought, no, 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 no. I'm on, on the one hand, it was good. I agree with everything they say. Like, for example, theory of mind. Uh, that autistic children and adults lack theory of mind, meaning they don't understand our behaviors, they don't understand our intentions, they don't understand our emotions. I agree with that, no problem. So they lack theory of mind. But I disagree, you know, with what? That it was one-sided. I thought, but do we understand their behaviors? Do we understand their emotions? Do we understand their intentions? Yes. Sorry, no, we don't. It means we lack theory of autistic mind. So that's what, see, for me, it was easier because I wasn't told, learn this, learn that. No, I started, my ignorance helped me very much. So I started developing my own theories. I mean, I'm trying, I was trying to understand what was going on. And uh, my son was very difficult. Yes, he didn't talk till he was seven. It was nonverbal completely. And... Uh, then he needed education, but he was uh, offered only a placement uh, in a special institution very far from the town, sort of in the middle of nowhere, for severely mentally retarded children and autism uh, and adults without any training because the verdict was he is hopeless. I do remember this. He is hopeless. And uh, another psychiatrist whom I found privately, I paid a lot of money <clears throat> for the consultation. You know what she said? Sorry. When I, I was telling her about what he does, what he doesn't do and whatever. And what she said was, and she was writing and she was silent. And I said, tell me anything. Is it dangerous? And she was writing. She w didn't look even at me. I said, is it dangerous and whatever? He won't die, will he? And she said, it's better if he had died. I still remember that. And I thought, better for whom? For you, for me, for him? So I paid your money, take it. And I left. And I decided if there are no specialists to help my son, I have to become a specialist myself. Okay. That's how I started studying autism in earnest, you know? And what is more, I was sure there were children, more children like my son, and I wrote a small article in a local newspaper. I didn't use the word autism because nobody knew what it was. I described my son and I said, uh, parents, if you want to help these children and if you keep them at home, come and see me. And that's, the first week, 16 families came to me. They were hiding their children. They also refused this placement to this institution. And as a specialist said, nobody will work with these children because they are unmanageable, unteachable, hopeless, right? And that's why I started my own school in my one room students hostel. And my first children, <laughs> my first students, and I started learning from them. It's not only I was teaching them, I was learning from them as well. And for me, it was obvious they perce per perceived the world differently. It wasn't about sort of their cognitive abilities. No, they perceive everything differently. Their, their behaviors were triggered by the environment, yeah. you know, yeah. because there's senses work differently and that's how I started researching sensory perception and then as I was a single mother uh, I remarried and uh, moved to England and uh, did my dissertation on sensory perception and that's how I started that's how my interest in autism started you know what I mean and that's why I started working uh, with autistic population no regrets my first life was yes but my second life even is even better you know the bonus i found in moving to a in a completely different direction in research and in my life i started learning about myself yeah. what i found out i didn't know who i was when i say uh let us be ourselves it's funny because see in my first life i was a different self completely different self. 
I, I can't say that I was bad or whatever. No, but I was different. Now I am sort of myself developed. And by the way, I still don't quite understand everything yet. Sometimes it takes a lifetime to understand who you are and that's what I'm working on. And that's how it started, okay. Perfect. Thank you, Alga. Can I ask you, Alga, around, uh, I know you've done a lot of work around um, communication and autism. Yeah. Can you tell me what initially uh, drew you specifically to communication? And I suppose what kind of communication issues are specifically faced by those who have autism or who are autistic? You know, uh, it was uh, the next logical step. If people, or uh, children and adults, perceive everything differently, right? It means they interpret everything differently. Yeah. It means they de interpret different ways to communicate, to uh, create, not create, to understand concepts, right? Generalize and so on and so forth. And language, I was so much interested in language they used and both nonverbal and verbal communication. And to tell you just a few sort of features of all communication difficulties in autism and language difficulties in autism. First, of course, it is delay in development of language, yeah. right? Uh, or uh, sometimes there are individuals who remain mute, uh, mute their whole lives, right? My son started uh, talking at, at the age of seven. And uh, you see, I was so ignorant at the time. I remember when he was three or four, every night I was praying. I am not a religious person, but I remember praying, please start talking, uh, please start talking. I'll tell you about this world. Uh, I will help you, but please help me help you. Yeah. Oh, I was so naive, right? Because <laughs> now I say, shut up, will you? He's talk, talking nonstop, but he's echolalic mostly, right? And a lot of repetitive questioning and so on and so forth, right? So that's how I saw that the language development is absolutely different yeah. from typically develop, uh, developing children and even children with um, delay in acquisition of language. So this is one of the features, right? The second, uh, even so-called high-functioning autistic people, autistic children, sometimes don't understand that language is a tool for communication. Okay. Like Donna Williams, I, I think she was a genius. Yeah. I learned so much when we talked, when we met, and from her books, she said she was about 10 when she started understanding that language was for communication. Yeah. She was echolalic and she was just uh, talking to herself, repeating phrases and whatever. So you see, even high functioning people. So my son definitely didn't understood it. When he started uh, till he was about 15, 16, he, wa uh, he was echolalic, he was repeating questions, he was repeating uh, commercials, you, you know, all this stuff. So, uh, but it wasn't for communication. So we, we worked on make it communicative, right? Then it is um, those who can talk and understand that language is for communication. Uh, there is no reciprocity. Some children start talking and especially about their favorite subjects, right? Yeah. And talk talk and talk and don't you dare interrupt yeah. because if you do, they will start from the very beginning That's again right. you know it's better just because they don't see whether, whether their communicative partner is bored or whatever and they have no time there is no <laughs> if you even look at your watch and whatever they wouldn't get it yeah. they would continue with this conversation so lack of reciprocity then a lack of understanding of gestures right perhaps no pointing lack of understanding emotional expressions, facial expression, body language. This is also a problem, uh, right? Then um, inadequate reaction to some phrases, words, emotional reaction. Some, can, some challenging behaviors can be triggered by a word, even a neutral word. I rem remember I was working with an adult, uh, non-verbal uh, verbal adult with autism and uh, 
I was lucky, one of the service users, he warned me, don't say sorry to Dave. Because the word sorry triggered his sort of challenging behaviors. Be because he didn't understand the meaning of it. But something bad in the past happened to him when this word was said, you know, and that's how he connected. So there are so many other <clears throat> things, plus verbal language, when they start developing verbal language, they, uh, it is sort of idiosyncratic, like yeah. echolalic, right? Echolalia, uh, like uh, pronoun reversal, very typical, uh, like uh, repetitive questioning, metaphorical language and other features of uh, verbal development, right? But yeah. These are the main things about differences in communication, but it doesn't mean that they do not communicate. <clears throat> it doesn't mean they do not, even non-verbally. The main problem is we don't understand their communication. Yeah. They have their gestures, but we don't understand their meanings. They have their verbal expression. They, we don't understand their meaning. So this is also important to remember, not to be one-sided. Their communication is impaired. And what about ours? Yeah. If we don't understand autistic, non-verbal and verbal communication, we are impaired in this. So let us sort of be fair and take the blame as well. Absolutely. I know I spoke with um, Amy Laurent um, from the search program, um, I suppose probably 12 or 18 months ago now, and she would speak very clearly about the responsibility uh, for any communication line with both individuals, not just mm. the, the autistic person, that, they, that we, we equally have, uh, have a level of responsibility to do our best to understand what is being communicated to us. Um, and I suppose if people tend sometimes to forget that, don't they? Mm -hmm. And another thing is parents often understand the language, yeah. both nonverbal and verbal. That's why it's so important to uh, have parents as a interpreters yeah. of their child. I remember I met one mother and we were talking in the kitchen while her nonverbal son, he was about five or seven, between five and seven. Yeah. And the only vocalizations uh, he produced was ah. Uh -uh, Ah, 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 and that is it. Yeah. Nothing, no, no consonants, nothing. And he was uh, in a living room, and he was ah, ah, in all the time, and we were talking, and suddenly his mother rushed to the living room, uh, telling me he's in trouble. Sort of, he heard something in all this ah, yeah. ah, 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 yeah. and yes, we found him behind the TV set with a screwdriver in his hand. Oh. How could mother, <clears throat> you know, to, because yeah. for me it was ah, 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 I didn't know yeah. uh, his language and she did. Yeah. And um, Olga, you mentioned um, echolalia, mm -hmm. um, that the your son would, would, uh, would it be predominantly echolalic now. Um, how do you, you, and you spoke about teaching him how to um, use it functionally. Do you have any pointers or tips for parents that might be listening in? who um, might be able to support their young person in utilizing that, that echolalic phrase um, and making it more functional so that it, it can be used as a means of communication. Yes, but let us start with that echolalia can be non-communicative and communicative, right? So non-communicative in the past, uh, you know, when they repeat all these phrases from TV or songs or whatever, or just few words. Yeah. But in the past, it was considered it should be eliminated completely. Oh, no. No. And uh, of course, I disagree. I always disagree with everything, you know. Yeah. And uh, because it is sensory play, you know, some like either this feeling on the, you know, feeling yeah. and the sounds and whatever it is. They love, but when they, are pronouncing certain words or phrases, whatever, they start giggling even. It's so pleasant. So we, sh we, sh we can't eliminate, we shouldn't, you know what I mean? But it should be time and place. First work and then you can play. Because see, I always say, if you want your child not to do something which the child loves to do, think about yourself. 
because see what they say oh it is inappropriate i am sorry our hobbies are all hobbies inappropriate yeah i know what you mean for the life of me i don't understand what is so pleasurable to watch grown up men running around one ball give them a ball each let them play i just i i i i think it doesn't make sense at all but see still if i th think i'm sorry it's not politically correct if i think it is stupid to watch it right no offense no offense no offense and but i wouldn't switch off the tv when my husband is watching it yeah. i thought okay yeah. whatever he's like a child so and communicative ecolalia there are so many different functions this is important if you want to shape it into something communicative you know i mean for us to understand it is communicative already but we have to understand its function right sometimes some ecolalia uh, um, children uh, the function is um like i I don't understand, like Donna Williams uh, uh, in her book describes it, that she didn't understand the language, but she understood that some sort of response was ex expected from her. So she repeated it back. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it's a different matter altogether. Some will, for some, it will be request if if they want to ask something and say do you want a biscuit they don't mean you want a biscuit uh, you know it's they want a biscuit it is here where we can help yeah you know very quietly you want a biscuit okay say i want a biscuit that's how i started with my son okay. shaping his language and here we come to the another problem pronoun reversal yeah you know for he, for them i and you and and for, for they don't understand it. Again, we have to think. For autistic children, one object, one word. Okay. If this is, I don't know, uh, I, can't, I can't think about something. Um, for example, if uh, this is a watch, okay. any other watch is not a watch you know what i mean they are very very different so one thing one uh, one word they don't like synonyms and whatever and look at this i and you it jumps the word jumps i know what you mean for my uh, for for my child his mother was i when she was talking about herself somebody talking about her she suddenly became she and when somebody approaches her, she suddenly be, uh, became you. Yeah. It is very, very confusing, right? So this, uh, so again, uh, it is possible helping the child to shape the phrase, you know, without sort of any forcing or whatever pressure, just quietly telling the child how to say it. And there, there are uh, other function is to win time because some needs more time to process what yeah. was said. Some wants to hear the same phrase uh, f with their own voice and whatever. There are so many functions of ekaleli, it is possible. Yes, it takes longer. You see, uh, with pronoun reversal, it's so funny. In the past, that was considered uh, that they had no self. They, they didn't understand self. And that's why they sort of use, uh, use you, uh, I and whatever they do understand it because they could say peter wants something meaning i want something or whatever it's just difficulty yeah. to, to understanding these jumping words and it's not only about pronouns it's about this and that right for me again this watch is here for you it is over there right again yeah. but it is the same location i'm sorry it hasn't moved anywhere. And the same about yesterday, today, tomorrow, for example. How can today become yesterday, yeah. tomorrow? You see, all this difficult. It is possible. Yes, it is. It takes longer, but it doesn't matter. I like that idea, actually, the word <laughs> one meaning. But I think if people oh, yes. hold, if people mm -hmm. hold that, uh, that true when they're hearing and when they're, when, they're, when they're trying to help support, develop communicative, ability if they hold that central and um, i have no doubt that they will have a uh, far greater success but i suppose the other thing to all that is with regards to that echolalic type and um, phrasing that people it's really important that people don't dismiss it just as 
um, uh, as a repetition of a phrase or a song or a, no, 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 whatever that, that there is potentially. And, and actually, in my opinion, um, all echolalic phrasing is communicating something, even if it is just communicating this wonderful joy that they're feeling or the fact that they want. To. Yes, I uh, no, yes, because see, for some children and adults, even right, uh, these phrases are the only means yeah. of communication, right. Yeah. You see, the, these are the only words they can say. Uh, I, I advise everyone to read books by Tito Mukhopat Hawaii, you know, yeah. and Nonverbal. He is a young man now. He writes about it brilliantly. He said, uh, my tongue could say only this word. He wanted to say something different. But my tongue, I quote, can say only this word. Or... Uh, Naoki Higashida, a Japanese yeah. young man now, yeah. I think, you know, their understanding of autism and language is much, much better than ours. And uh, of course, yeah. So this is uh, very, very important to remember. They do communicate. They are communicating all the time. Yeah. It's not only their problems that we don't understand it, them, it's ours. We have to learn Absolutely. about their ways of communication. Yeah, and I suppose I know then in our home as well, Alga, I know my youngest, the youngest person in our home, um, he's uh, fully speaking, he's got a very wide um, a range of vocab, but he immediately moves into echolalic phrases when he's anxious. Yes, absolutely. Communication of the, Yes, yes. You know, so it's not just um, those individuals who are non-speaking that will present with that kind of echolalic uh, phrase. As I say, uh, it can be somebody with this huge expansive language that's, that also becomes echolalic in moments where they don't have the words to... Uh, yes. And by the way, even so-called low-functioning uh, autistic people, when they are anxious, especially, right, or stressed or overloaded, they can sort of lose the ability to talk or they can, you know, they have this um, difficulty to access the right words. Donna Williams writes a lot about it. And, you know, uh, this is another myth of, about autism. They say what they think. I'm sorry, no. And like uh, Naoki Higashida and Tito and Donna Williams and others say, even yes or no questions sometimes are tricky. Yeah. Because they need the time to process sort of what do you want, this or that or whatever. And that is why this policy, uh, self-centered approach, it's very good. I'm not criticizing it. But what I've seen was there, there were these meetings when an adult or a child was present around the table and there were parents, psychologists, teachers, whatever, right? And they asked him, what do you want to do? And expecting that the, even verbal children, you know what I mean? Yeah. At this time can say whatever is available at the time. So it's really, really tricky. Yeah. to really check all the time what this child wants to do. Yeah. Don't think, oh, he says it, it means he's right. Again, this nonverbal people who have written these books, they are brilliant uh, when they explain what is going on. Yeah. I suppose one example that I often give in, uh, in one of my classes is if you, like if I've ever been driving a car and if somebody was to tip the back of my car, even gently, um, I have no doubt that I would lose my capacity to find the words and I would immediately start crying. Yes. It was a fright that I would get. And um, when you think about it like that, we all we all have have and will continue to have moments where we can't find the words to 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 state what we need to to yes. speak. And I suppose when you think about that that uh, round table meeting with small children or with older children or or indeed adults, um can you like th there's a huge social demand and pressure placed on mm -hmm. the person so it's so actually those kind of meetings need to be changed the format of them need to be changed and there needs to be an alternative way in which to ascertain information from that autistic person yeah really do you know and um, alga can i ask you would you explain to me what the sensory perceptual experience of a person is to my listeners this is my exciting this is because i'm really this is my favorite <laughs> You know, again, uh, I'll start with uh, what I don't like uh, while discussing it. 
uh, then you see my sort of perspective on this. Uh, in the past, the sensory problems were not recognized at all. Now they are recognized, I should be happy. I am not, I will explain. Because uh, mostly it's about hypersensitivity. If you listen to somebody, they said, oh, they're too hypersensitive, whatever. I don't deny it, yes. Yes, hypersensitivity is a huge problem or hyposensitivity as well. But these are consequences of other sensory perceptual differences. Okay. They are not at the root of this, right? There are much more important phenomena we should know. For example, what I call gestalt perception, but it is inability to filter information. They are too open, their brains are too open, let's use this metaphorically, to all the stimulation, because we are surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of stimuli every minute, right? Yeah. And we are sort of block out irrelevant stimuli, and we focus on what is relevant. But what is relevant for us is not relevant for autistic people, actually. And what is more, they have no capacity to block irrelevant stimulation, right? Sort of their brains are overstimulated. They cannot filter this information. And that is why they, when they start processing something, they start processing bit by bit by bit. And here we have fragmentation. And this is where weak central coherence come in. Okay. You see, at this stage of sensation, sort of, that is why, see, this theory is right, okay. but it's not sort of the cause of everything. At the start of sensation, they cannot filter out information, right? No filters. Mm -hmm. And at the start of interpretation and processing, we come to this fragmentation. Like Donna Williams, she said, most of the time her word, uh, world was fragmented. Uh, I remember because we were sitting together and she was, she was telling me, when I look at you, I can see your eye. Yeah. At the stage of sensation, she could see me. But processing, she started with eye and she said, then I move my eyes and I see her nose, but your upper lip and whatever. And she said, I, you, I, and I had to put everything together in my, my head. Okay. But by the time she was wearing tinted glasses, the special glasses, colored glasses, and they helped immensely. Fantastic. She said, as soon as she put on these glasses, she saw a room. Yeah. Not a handle, door handle, not a table leg or something, the whole room. By the way, recently, uh, my son is wearing uh, uh, Erlen glasses as well. Yeah. And recently, I want to show you, these are my, my glasses. Oh, oh, gosh. Very stylish. <laughs> uh, Very oh, go no, it's not stylish. It's so much easier. You know what I mean? For me. And uh, they are here all the time because when I work at the computer, I'm wear wearing them. Okay. They're actually really nice. Leave them on you, Olga. I will because, uh, see, I can... It's more comfortable you leave them on. I don't know whether you notice, but I can relax now. Yeah, you're, you're actually all automatically just... Uh, yes, because it's so much easier. Anyway, so, and fragmentation can be in any sensory modality. It can be auditory modality. When the person can hear the whole sentence, right? Yeah. Here but process just a few words. For example, John, blah, 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 kitchen. Okay. You know what I mean? These are fragments and they have to put it together and they don't know how. The, uh, tactile fragmentation and so on and so forth. Then there, uh, then there are uh, distortions of all sorts because of all this overload, of all yeah. this uh, inability to filter the information. And of course, their senses be become hyper hypersensitive. This is the proper place for, for this uh, phenomenon. Okay, and there are many, many, many others like inconsistency of perception. Their perception fluctuates. Sometimes they can be hyper to something, that, you know, hypo and so on and so forth. It depends on many factors and environment, one of them, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, ah, and Thank you. And uh, just, uh, I have to mention okay. this, uh, system shutdowns. Yeah. It, because without our help, children learn to protect themselves. Okay. And they learn to switch off 
their painful sensory channel. And uh, most of the time it is auditory, right? Many of them are very, very hypersensitive auditory. And I remember my son, he was about four or five, standing uh, in the middle of the room and I was talking to the nurse. And then she wanted to, to talk to him and I came up to him. I was standing behind him and I was shouting his name. He didn't even blink. And as if he was sort of deaf. And this nurse, oh, you, you, you have to go and check his hearing. He might be deaf. I never doubt that he wasn't. Because I knew if I would start unwrapping his favorite biscuit in the kitchen, he will be next to me in seconds. Absolutely. His hearing was so hypersensitive. He learned to switch it off. So they shut down, you know, and they do protect themselves without our help. Mm -hmm. Now, I have two questions based on all you've just said. I suppose the first thing is around dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Around um, Ireland syndrome. I know that I've got one young person. Yes, yeah considered very severely dyslexic in inverted commas and he has Ireland syndrome in uh, lenses, uh, the Ireland lenses and he definitely, um, his reading um, ability has has definitely yes. improved as a result. So I suppose um, would would Ireland syndrome, would that kind of, those Ireland lenses and would, would that kind of sensory perceptual difficulty speak to some of the dyslexia type traits that we see as well? Uh, yes, you know, Helen Earle, and I know Helen, she is my dearest friend, and, and uh, she started working uh, with dyslexics. Okay. And that's how she discovered that color helped to read, because uh, dyslexics, they could see text, but it can be moving or sort of, you know, blurry or whatever. <laughs> and for whatever reason, colors help. What is interesting, they are very individual. Different people have different colors. And Donna Williams was the first autistic person to approach Helen. Okay. And she was diagnosed with Erlen syndrome and prescribed these lenses. And that's when she advised me to check Alosha's, wow. my son's uh, vision. Because we were sitting on the floor in her bungalow. She uh, used to live in, in, in the south of England on the carpet and uh, talking and Alusha was running around us flicking something you know and she said he sees the way I did before I started wearing my glasses and that's when I checked uh, that Alusha's vision and he, he was prescribed brown glasses brown colors and we never looked back Fantastic. it helped really really very much Fantastic. he started reading that's when he started reading and everything Brilliant. I suppose I, I, I'll make sure to put that on my Facebook page, just information on Ireland uh, lenses, should anybody want to read more about it, I can put up some papers. About it. Yeah, uh, tinted lenses do help, yeah. because there are several, you know, different schools, uh, you know, yeah. but, but still, for me, this was the best present I ever got. It's from Helen herself, she sent me these glasses. God, I must I must get on to her, I think. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you as well, Alka, then based upon that Ireland, the, the Ireland lenses and so on, um, and just on that kind of sensory perceptual fragmentation that you spoke about, um, we oftentimes hear about young people uh, having difficulty following more than one instruction at a time and so on and so forth. Do you believe that that's linked in with that fragmentation and sensory perception? Of course. With regards to the auditory thing? You know, um, what is happening for some for some they can process just a few words one or two at a time yeah you know it's so important to know each child but when i started working with alusha when he was about three four and five our first class because i, I was i was desperate to help him uh what uh, lasted 20 seconds that's all he could process yeah. You know, but for me, it was a victory. The first victory Absolutely. that 20 seconds, he could understand what was going on and what I was saying. You know, yes. And for whatever reason, the colors of the lenses slow down perhaps the stimulation and yeah. they are able to process more at a time. So yes, it's, uh, everything is connected. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm just I, I I'm taking in what you're saying because it's very like it's just so so fascinating. But yeah, but it's important to know. You know what I mean? Because address your visual problem, and you will help your hearing. You know what I, I, mean? Yeah. I mean? Like uh, when we were to uh, talking, Don and I, you know, I said, look, he's very hypersensitive auditorily. His hearing is painful. He, you remember the shutdowns and whatever? She said, no, 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 no. His main problem is vision. Just trust me. I am happy I trusted her. Because as soon as he started wearing his glasses, his hearing improved. Yeah. So he still is hypersensitive, but it is not painful anymore. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, and uh, theoretically, if you want theoretical explanation, look, if your vision is unreliable, if distorted, fragmented, or whatever, hypersensitive, what would you do? You would use other senses, right? To see. It means hearing was doing two, sense, uh, two, two jobs, hearing and vision. By the way, by the sound, uh, what I was doing in the kitchen, my son knew what I was doing. By the sound, how I put something on the table. He, you see his ears, <laughs> he, with his ears, he saw what I was doing. As soon as I started doing their own job, hearing improved if you like right yeah. sort of still he he is much better than anyone else in our family no um, perhaps i am better very hypersensitive hearing but not painful and it's not painful anymore for him but just one warning when he started wearing glasses uh he wouldn't leave the house without his glasses i never told him don't forget your glasses you see he knew Okay. The first time he tried, like Donna said, the first time he, she tried, she thought, oh gosh, it's so different. He knew, but sometimes the glasses didn't work. Okay. In certain situations, like, you know, a lot of overcrowded place, yeah. a lot of sounds, smells, movement, people, his glasses didn't work. And, you know, and he became sort of, Okay, challenging behaviors, but it's very interesting. He became angry with his glasses. Okay. He, he was heating his glasses because they didn't work anymore. You know, still we have to provide sort of more or less safe environment. Yeah. So don't overdo it. Don't take them everywhere yeah. and whatever. Fantastic. Fantastic. I suppose when I think about, when you think about, um, Autism, it, it, the, the field of autism, ordinarily people think about processing being one section or generalization being a piece or sensory processing being a piece. And I suppose you're speaking really to the, the, the fact that all of these should be considered a whole and that of course it should be, uh, that, that they're so interlinked that you can't separate them, that they have to be um, support, the individual has to be supported as a whole not just in one small area or, or in of course that is why you know what i mean all the senses are interconnected like this is one sense is affected other senses become affected as well so it, it is important to find which one is the most important one i mean you know the main the trigger of all this domino effect and address the problems for my son and donna williams it was vision for somebody you know uh, annabel Stelly. Yeah. Her book, a Sound of a Miracle, yeah. or her daughter, it was auditory. Yeah. And uh, she lost the diagnosis of autism after auditory inter integration training. But after this book, it was a bestseller, of course. Many families took their children to these centers. Yeah. No more miracles. I mean, perhaps one or two. Why? Because for, for Georgie, her, her daughter, the main problem was hearing right? This inability to filter out information, distortions, fragmentation, hypersensitivity, which triggered all these other senses uh, to be overloaded. Yeah. But for my son, it is vision, right? For somebody else, somebody else. So it's yeah. so important to find out which one. Yeah. Yes. And then you will see the improvement. Another thing is, uh, you know, it's quite a common picture. A young girl, for example, autistic girl, nonverbal smelling things and people right what do we say don't smell people it is not nice 
Of course it isn't nice, I agree with that. But if it is the only reliable channel the girl uses to get, to make sense of what is going on, actually we try to shut her down completely. Instead of investigating which senses or, or, and why, whatever, are affected, sort of provide her some treatment, like even glasses or whatever, whatever, for different sense, different approaches, right? And the girl will stop smelling. You won't, you don't have to tell her this, if she can rely on other senses. By the way, my, my son was like this. He smelled anything, everything, and whatever. He could, <laughs> before the glasses. He, smell, he smelled his food. Before he, he would touch his food, he had to smell it. Because his vision was unreliable. As soon as his vision improved, he stopped smelling. Yeah, okay, okay. sometimes if I choose the perfume, I say, Alusha, what do you think? <laughs> and whatever, it's different, you know, but, but yeah. he doesn't use his nose now to learn about the world, yeah. okay? And strangely enough, he doesn't wear glasses at home. Uh, I wear them at home only at the computer. Okay because uh, you know this blickering and it's really hard for for my eyes but outside he he wouldn't leave the house even if it is night time okay. this is interesting at night when it is dark he needs his glasses even more than it, when it is uh, sunshine okay because of the contrast you know these lamps yeah bright light yeah. cars passing darkness it's even harder them so he is happy to wear his dark glasses when we go somewhere in the evening but at home he doesn't need it again why because we adjusted the home we didn't do it consciously you know what i mean i cannot tolerate bright lights i can't yeah. we have no bright lights at home right uh, so that's why see we adjusted the environment for our needs and it works okay uh, one person is unhappy it's my husband, he, he likes lights, but in my family, it is democracy. Yeah. The majority don't. Majority. So, majority. <laughs> yes, majority. so we are trying. <clears throat> no, but he does understand how important it is for us. Fantastic. You know. And... Fantastic. Um, would you do me a favor, Olga, and just tell um, uh, listeners what the name of your book is, because I know that they, that anybody who finds our, our like the last five minutes of this conversation interesting will find your book exceptionally interesting. Well. About sensory perception. Yeah. Oh, give me a second. Just so that people can, uh, it, so that people can read up more about them. Uh, it is sensory perceptual issues in autism and Asperger syndrome. Perfect. Okay, and with this picture, because it's important to remember the picture, because this is the first edition of the book. Yeah. Actually, it's my dissertation okay. <laughs> without methodology and all this stuff, and it was published in 2000 or whatever, but of course, this is the revision, revised edition. Have, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so please don't confuse, okay? Perfect. So this is the okay. second I, I can vouch for the fact that that book is will be very very interesting to anybody who will have read, who will have found the last segment of our chat interesting. They will absolutely love uh, love your book definitely. Oh, not sure, but lo okay. <laughs> well, I, I'll vouch for it. I'll vote. For yeah, flattering, f flattering. Oh, it's it's flattering. Yeah, thank you. Very modest. Um, I'll go, I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction and ask you, what are the benefits and disadvantages of using visual forms of communication, like texts, uh, for example? Oh, okay. But see, um, <laughs> we have to talk about first cognitive processes. I will explain why. Okay? Uh, because they develop language differently, right? And uh, yes, there are verbal thinkers in, um, among autistic population, but they are mostly Asperger syndrome or uh, the other end of the spectrum. Because uh, many autistic people are perceptual thinkers, either visual, right, or auditory, or tactile and kinesthetic. Yeah. I'm kinesthetic learner. Yeah. I'm not visual, definitely. I in can't case, see anything. Movement always. Yeah, well, yeah, I can't talk without movement. Uh, it helps 
you know what I mean? I'm kinesthetic. You know, my son is not visual, never been visual. For him, packs wouldn't work. Okay. What is important, like Donna Williams says, I visualize like, um, no, like a blind person. She said, I, I, I can't visualize like without uh, movement, she uses movement and acoustics, how things sound when they tapped and whatever. She is not a visual person. And sometimes uh, these pictures, Pax pictures are very confusing especially if they are line drawings. I will tell you Donna's again example. Uh, line drawings, packs, line, line drawings for uh, play or leisure time when two figures, you know, lines uh, and a ball in between. She said, for me, it was a spider. Okay. So she has to learn. When she's shown a spider, it means, it, it means it's time to play or break time and uh, lunch a plate you know with something on this and knives she said for her it was a face with, with a black eye again so again she has to interpret when I, I show i'm shown the face with a bruise it means it's time to eat something you know so for, for these people uh, it's really confusing so if you work in a class and there are 10 students and seven are visuals, for example, it's great. It, it will work for them. But three won't benefit it from it okay. because the majority, yes, are visual thinkers, but not all of them. Okay. Okay, so it, it should be, uh, you should be very, very careful. And by the way, again, Naoki Higashida, for me, it was sort of something new, but that confirmed how right I was. It was so funny. I, I learned it from his books recently. He said, even for visual thinkers, for for some autistic who are visual thinkers, uh, these timetables, visual timetables are not uh, often useful because they are very rigid, you know what I mean? And sort of for them, he said, I always check whether they're doing the right thing and what not, whatever. Uh, for me, it was really interesting because when I started my school, when I, I knew nothing about autism, by the way, it helped because I learned from my, my students for, for, from these four children first and then 18 children at the end. And you know what I did? My timetables, we never used pictures. Perhaps my, my son was not visuals. But anyway, we used words, yeah. verbal. It was mathematics, reading, break, and whatever. And they learned to read. Very, uh, th those words, they learned to read. Yeah. So that's why... It, uh, it's good if you use a visual picture, whatever, there should be a written word underneath. Yeah, so it will help, really help. But sort of just to say that it doesn't work for everyone. That's why it's better to use for those who are not visuals, uh, to use objects wow. instead of pictures, giving a spoon in before lunchtime and whatever, yeah. <coughs> or movements or written language yeah. and what, mm -hmm. by the way, objects uh, are safe because uh, they can cover many languages, like they are visual, let us start with this. Then they are tactile, you can touch them, yeah. you can smell them, you can tap, tap them, sort of, it covers many languages yeah. and create object timetable for somebody who is not visual in your classroom. Okay, okay, perfect. I know that um, many professionals here would recommend that you start with a, a, that kind of an object schedule, but that you should move through that kind of hierarchy of visuals then right up to the, the, the word. Do you the believe, book? Olga, that you'd be better, or like, or you move from there to the, the, the Toby, that token object based icon, and so on and so forth? Do you believe so that would we be best positioned to offer different schedules based upon, um, based upon? are based upon sensory profiles, shall we say, of course. instead of trying to follow these, because I know lots of professionals do tend to try and follow that moving through the stages. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it, uh, yeah, I understand your question. You know, uh, I wouldn't, no, I didn't, I never followed any sort of whatever. I, I thought what is best for, the, for these children. Because, see, if you start with visuals, yeah, with children who are not vis uh, visual thinkers what is the point okay just start with objects 
you know what I mean? Yeah. So, or if they're kinesthetic, like I am, for example, movements, movements, and it really helps. Uh, to ex and it helps to express myself, for example, right? And to understand all this as well. And let us go, uh, sign language. Yeah. Don't, I'm, how shall I put it? Not to be too... Sign language uh, was created, was designed for, um, deaf, uh, for the deaf community, yeah. right? It is too linguistic for our autistic children okay it is too literal uh, they are too literal and this is ling linguistics they remember one word one object right and they are literal they don't like idioms they don't understand them it's not about like or dislike and what uh, again donna williams she said for milk sign is this yeah she said if somebody shows me this i will interpret it Donna, do you want to see the cow milked? She is okay. literal. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or biscuit. I know the sign biscuit, right? What is biscuity about this biscuit? Tell me. I know the origin. It's about sailors and whatever. But <clears throat> for the child, uh, as Donna said, if I want milk or whatever, it's easier this. Yeah. Exactly. Of course, it can it can mean not only milk, but it can mean a drink. At least you will know Donna wants a drink, mm -hmm. and you can offer milk, tea, juice, whatever, yeah. and biscuit. Instead of this, how can the child connect this uh, with biscuits? She said, "I will do this." Yeah, exactly. Again, it can mean anything, but at least you will know Donna wants something to eat, and it, uh, you can offer banana, biscuit, and whatever, and then see what she wants. <laughs> And another thing is, aren't we preparing them for independence? Don't you want, or don't we want our children be live happily, independently, or with little support? Tell me how many people understand sign language. Yeah. Shops, you know, restaurants, outside, very few, right? And can you imagine a big autistic man, nonverbal, comes to the pub and shows this? Yeah. You see? Yeah. There might be trouble as well. Yeah. And if he shows that he wants to eat something and drink, yeah. it's a di different matter altogether. So that's why, see, I, I, I think sign language, so much time teaching them those signs which are very linguistics, linguistic, right? And they are very literal instead of mimes. Yeah, those gestural things that we kind of- Mimes, do. yes, mimes, like, like oh, toilet, oh, what, what, how can you, you know, they don't, oh, I, I, I love your descriptions. She said it's so illogical and irrational. It takes a lot of time and effort, but it's better to use mimes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That so see, it's not just follow from this, that, and that. It depends on the person, of course. Yeah. And written language, I think it's it's really, really important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Donna, can I or Alga, can I ask you what kind of factors must be considered when helping the autistic individual to select and utilize the correct form or forms of communication for them? Um, first of course, to find out which language this particular individual speaks, yeah. right? Speaks. Like if they're visual, yes, it will be visual. If kinesthetic, tactile, and so on and so forth. This is important to find out the language your child speaks. Yeah. Use this plus environment. Create the environment where the child is not distracted where they can actually learn something. What is more, a lot of different approaches, right? Uh, you know, there is direct approach, teaching it, and indirect uh, approach. Yeah. Again, some children who are described as aloof, withdrawn in their own world, yes, we should be more direct a bit with them. Yeah. Sort of, you know, trying to attract their attention, right? Others who cannot tolerate eye contact because many of them can't tolerate eye contact 
and you start your teaching this child, look at me. It means the child will learn nothing. 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 But their peripheral perception is very, very acute. So with these children, indirectly confrontational approach should be used, right? And the, the main thing about it is don't insist on eye contact. Talk to the wall, talk to the floor, talk to your shoes, whatever. Mentioning the child's name from time to time and let the child respond the same way. And it's again, when teaching, sit next to the child, not in front of the yeah. child. But it's funny, my, my children, my, my daughter and my son, when they were younger, they found out to communicate. It's so funny, uh, uh, they themselves, uh, I entered their room and I saw they were talking to Alosha's, to my son's uh, toy, favorite toy. My daughter was addressing the toy and my son was answering. It's, it was so funny. Yeah. They didn't talk uh, face to face because they can, if you want children to understand what you're saying, it's better not to insist on eye contact. Okay. And another thing is the other side of the same coin. Don't discuss the child. Even if you think the child won't understand what you're talking. Yeah. I am sorry. Perhaps some children won't. They will remember this. Yeah. Verbal, uh, uh, word by word, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes you will hear what they say. Anyway, it hurts when they hear about themselves, yeah. not very good things. But what is not <laughs> uh, hurt, I mean, about this, uh, is you can discuss your child. Discuss, sort of, you know, you can talk to your colleague, for example, say, Ma or, you know, Mary, She's such a clever girl. Today she did this thing. Mary would be happy. But if you say, Mary, you're so clever, you're so good. Poor girl. Yeah. She will go further into herself. Yeah. You know, all, all this round of applause. and It's, it's really not, not good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I suppose, Alva, I have been the parent who has sat in the car where my child couldn't escape. Where we could, where we had a conversation, like where we would have conversations side by side, where they wouldn't have to look at me, but they were, we'd say they 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 were in a space that they couldn't get out of, so that yeah. I was able to encourage kind of some some level of communication. And I've also been the parent who has literally um, shared these most humongous, magnificent stories about my children with other adults, yeah. just so that they feel proud of themselves. Yes. You know I mean? so yes. It yes. really does work. It actually really does. Yes. The next day, they 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 kind of have a puff of pride when they like when they're going back into school or when they're, you know, the next time they're doing a test, they don't worry as much because they know that yeah. they were amazing. Or do you, do you know it does? It works beautifully. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Not just oh, you, you see why I'm so angry about this yeah. round of applause yeah. because perhaps it was used with my son. Now he's 32, yeah. and sometimes he said round of applause. I said forget it. You yeah. can imagine. I know. You, you know, it's just unbelievable. I know. I know. I suppose it's about it's about building them up, um, whilst not being overt about it or whilst not being in their face about it. Yes. Yes. Do you know? Um, Alga, can I ask you, um, can you tell my listeners a little bit about the International Autism Institute that you helped to establish? Uh, it happened in 2010. I visited uh, a very beautiful city in Siberia, uh, Krasnoyarsk. It is, by the way, the geographical center of Russia. Yeah. Beautiful city, one million people. It's beautiful. It was personal, uh, personal reasons I visited it and not very sort of happy ones. <laughs> My mother died. And um, anyway, and I went to the university. I, I was quite known there because of my work on autism, you know, and my books were translated into Russian as well. And, uh, and that's how it happened. And we decided, look, we need work together internationally, you know, and, and we started this uh, organization. It's um, sort of attached to the university psychology department. 
and we had three sort of main aims. First, it is research with different countries, and uh, it was education of specialists, and we started online courses, and the first course was, I remember, because I was uh, doing the uh, a lecturer for this course, uh, seven countries, students from seven countries were there and it was fantastic because students were not only learning about autism, different approaches and whatever, it was sort of three part course, it was really university course, it was proper university course and it was master's course. Uh, and but they were learning, uh, there were discussions, of course, and they were learning from each other and they're learning about the situation of autism in other countries and other cultures. It was really fantastic. So it was education for specialists and parents as well, because what we found is it's good to have groups where both professionals and parents were learning and they learn about each other's needs as well. And another thing uh, was, it is uh, education of autistic children and adults. Again, curricula for this, uh, sort of, it is one of them. It was education, sort of research, education, and work with families, of course, and parents and uh, professionals trying to sort of unite them yeah. and to, to teach them to, how to help their children. And uh, yeah, and of course publications. Uh, I was responsible for um, producing different sort of, how do you say, not books, but not textbooks at least. Okay. Uh, we call it University for Parents okay. because I started writing uh, a short uh, about 100 pages books uh, for Romanian organization. Okay in Romanian, it was in Romanian, and it is the first part in, in a series, uh, Autism Becoming a Professional Parent. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, it is the first book I've written as a mother, because all my books, it, like a professional, right? Yeah. Like a lecturer, like an academic. But this was the first book I've written as a mother. Okay. And the first book, of course, was about sensory perception. Yeah. Now I am writing, now it's the second one, it is about communication. The third one, it will be emotional and social aspects of autism. Mm -hmm. Then it will be medical and whatever. So it show, I, uh, to give you the idea, I will show you. Because this book is translated, we, we were writing it for uh, international, right? So the Romanian, this was, oh, wait, what's happened? It's just gone out of focus. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, can you? So this is uh, the book, this uh, mm -hmm. Autism Becoming a Professional Parent for Romanian, but it was translated uh, in Macedonian. Wow. It was translated into Russian. Wow. And it was translated into Italian. Fantastic. You can recognize both children, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, and this is sort of university for parents. Wow. Uh, it um, explains very difficult phenomenon with a simple language, okay. you know, and from the point of view of parent and mother. I love to writing it because you see, I could express my own emotion. It's not yeah. about references to this research paper or that research paper. I could talk to parents in these books as a mother, okay. you know, and... Um, yeah, that's what we, we've done in Autism, uh, International Autism Institute. And in 2016, this uh, International Autism Consor uh, Consortium of Autism Institutes was created and it was uh, Great Britain. I was representing Great Britain. It was in the same university, so it was, yes, Siberia. It was America uh, and uh, one of the leading neurologists in autism, Manuel Casanova presented it and he's uh, he was uh, the first president of this consortium and china as well wow. plus spain and uh, now we we, uh, we get more in bulgaria and perhaps brazil we are joining our efforts so the same aim right mm -hmm. sort of trying to promote yeah, autism research yeah. educate yes yes internationally
Fantastic. Olga, I'm going to, to ask you this book, this uh, professional parenting book. Is there any, uh, there's no English version of this book? Because I recognize the picture of your beautiful boy and beautiful girl on the front of that Italian cover. Um, but that, that doesn't seem to be available in English at all, is it not? I will tell you why. Uh, because see, English publishers <laughs> don't want their book, if it's been translated uh, already, if it's published in other languages. Okay. Okay. I can send you as a gift in oh, English, oh, in PDF, <laughs> in PDF, because see, it's like, um, I, I was going to publish it like Amazon publishing, but no time to do this. And I'm so useless with covers and whatever. Uh, but uh, because one of the publisher started with, uh, she, they were so happy, they liked the idea and whatever, but then they learned that it's been translated in several languages, but it was written for these countries. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but anyway. Well, I, they I want, follow up on that PDF. Definitely. They want global rights and... Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, sugar. Um, I suppose the, the, the autism community is lost in that case, you know, particularly us. Uh, parents of autistic young. Yeah, but see what we were trying to do. We started with Eastern Europe, like Romania, and uh, because there are not many books in Romanian, you know yeah. what I mean? That's why we, we try to help them with information. So yeah. that's how we started. Um, mm. Fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'm going to, to step back for a minute. Um, I'm looking at my list of questions and I've actually skipped a really important one. I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm wondering, what are the various perceptual and cognitive styles that we do see in autistic people? I know this can be linked with, sen uh, with sensory perceptual experiences and so on. So could you explain a little bit about that, please? Yes, uh, first let us st start with perceptual styles, right? Because everything starts with sensory perception, not uh, cognitive things, you know, influencing sensory perception, it's a bit different. Uh, it's uh, one of them is monoprocessing. Like okay. uh, typically developing people, they use all their senses simultaneously, right? They can see, they can hear sounds, they can feel and whatever. Uh, for many autistic people who are who use this monoprocessing, it is too much. Yeah. They use one sense at a time. Yeah. If they see, look and see something, right? I mean, they understand what they are seeing. They can lose uh, the ability to understand to process auditory stimulus, right? Uh, and what we, uh, we we should know about this style again uh, while dual perceptual assessment it's important to find out whether this is the case because if the child is doing something like buttoning or buttoning or whatever yeah. with his eyes closed or just not looking what do we say look what you are doing right yeah. that is it the child will lose the tract altogether. You know, it's important to know about this. And they can switch between visual or auditory and whatever. It helps. They use one sense at a time, not to be overloaded. So it's also not only a style, but protective, some sort of protective mechanism, right? Then, uh, as I said already, peripheral perception. Yeah. Because it's, uh, of course, we have to teach them to look at the person eventually yes in first they will we will start talking to the wall then in the direction of the child but not looking and then sort of they look either here or at their shoulder you know what i mean yeah. because uh, again many people outside the field they don't understand it and they would find it suspicious if our children for example don't look so they will learn to look in the direction of the child or of the of their communicative partner it's funny one of the uh, autistic adults i uh, heard him saying when he's introduced he was introduced to somebody he said do you want eye contact or conversation i loved I like it this. Like yeah, like and uh, you know, and they uh, teach each other sometimes, look at their forehead, look at their shoulder, they will never see the difference. So see, uh, all these tricks are very important to remember. So this perceptual style and another one, uh, is it's um, especially typical for so-called low functioning or 
people like Donna Williams, for example, very with whose self whose ego is not developed let us put it this way okay uh, i will explain it you will see what i mean it is resonance it is uh, these people resonate with the environment yeah. you know this body problems motor, motor problems with the body some don't feel their body at all right yeah. can you imagine uh some don't feel where their body ends and the environment begins yeah. you know it, it, it's all this pro so they are connected much more connected and they feel call it whatever you want energy vibrations or whatever i'm not going to this uh, new age and whatever but no it's it's absolutely natural for example if uh, somebody is angry you do see it right like somebody's red face and yeah. like, like this, or two people are arguing, so husband and wife, for example, in the kitchen, shouting at each other, plates are flying around, you know what I mean? And you knock at the door, silence, they open the door, smiling, you enter the kitchen, you feel it. Do you agree with this? Yeah. Absolutely. You feel it and you are not sort of as hypersensitive as many autistic are, for example, right? So many of them, many autistic children and adults, uh, it's like they feel the, these emotions physically. They don't interpret them. And this is very, very difficult for them. Uh, Stephen Shaw, yeah. you know, Professor Stephen yeah. Shaw, also my very good friend, and he uh, coined the term to describe this, echoemotica. Yeah. It's like they feel our emotions physically in their body. Yeah. And they don't understand whether it is their emotions, their sensations, or somebody else's. Like Stephen said, it, it took him a long time to learn to distinguish between his emotions yeah. and somebody else's. And why it is important to know, because sometimes it is us who triggers their challenging behaviors. Yeah. It, you see, when a teacher, for example, with some personal problems and she thinks it's okay, I'm professional, I can sort of do my job. If there is a child who is very hypersensitive to this, suddenly he or she will feel this energy i said again energy perhaps not the right word i don't know and starts fidgeting and of course teacher starts a bit shouting or whatever it's like a snowball yeah. sometimes it is us who trigger the behavior i know it personally yeah. by the sound i open the front door you know this with the handle when I come from conferences or my uh, university work and whatever, my son knows whether it is, I am in a good mood or yeah. like uh, I am I am tired but happy, or I am tired and very angry. Yeah, it, it, it's um, impossible to pretend otherwise. Yes, I can smile and whatever, but doesn't matter. He feels it. Yeah. You see. Sort of it, it, this resonance, and these people resonate with animals as well, with yeah. nature, yeah. and that's why they are very spiritual, yeah. and yeah. very, very spiritual. Absolutely. Ah, and to... now we are moving to cognitive styles, or not? Yeah. No, I just, I just say that uh, we have two small people in this house, um, who pick up on absolutely everybody else's emotional state yes um, and my youngest guy actually what we've started to do and i don't know he, he's engaging with it so um we're, we're utilizing it um, and i know people think that new age crystals and all that kind of stuff some people don't agree with it but it's giving him some sense of control over what's going on and um, he holds uh, we, we've gotten specifically the crystal that he holds and that he does a thing called bubbling up where he closes his eyes and he imagines himself in an unbreakable bubble of pure, uh -huh. pure light, whatever color he chooses, and yeah. he closes his eyes and he squeezes in tight, and then he say, "Well, my my bubble today was blue, mom, or my bubble today is red, mom, or my bubble today is yellow, mom, or whatever the case may be." But he's engaging with it, and it's giving him that kind of sense of security that yes. perhaps otherwise he wouldn't have. 
Yes. So it's work, It's working well. No, I don't know whether or not it will work for the children, but it's definitely working in our home yes. with him. So. Yes. Yes, and it, it is important to know about, let us call it perceptual style, if you like, right? Yeah. This resonating, merge, merging with certain stimuli, merging yeah. and resonating. Yes, exactly. it's like sometimes, uh, like, like Donna describes uh, self, they don't feel self because they feel self everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, this unity with everything around them. So this is the perceptual style if you like absolutely now i'll get tell me about the perceptual style cognitive <laughs> you know it's um like the there are two say the main styles subconscious yeah. and conscious conscious it is rational it is sort of you know one subconscious you see, even not if we do not consciously attend to something, we still perceive it. Yeah. Subconsciously, like Donna Williams call it, storing room. Yeah. A lot of information comes. You are not conscious of this, yeah. but it can be triggered, whatever. And again, she she calls it unknown knowing. She said, sometimes I can answer the question. I didn't know the answer to this question. But I, I answer this question and then surprised, how did I know? You know, it's just like, yeah. and they think subconsciously. Not all of them, of course. Like, okay, we are not talking about, uh, I'm trying to show how some autistic uh, people, uh, their thinking processes, right? And uh, again, sub what is more conscious is a direct style, right? You sort of, you know, by watching and whatever, whatever. And subconscious, it's you know by experience. Yeah. You you store experiences. It's, yeah. it's very very different, and thinking in this style is very 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 different, uh, because it is indirect and indirectly the storage for information is unlimited yeah. you can take in so much well consciously it's really really more limited then memory and thinking in autism it is perceptual right we, we talked already about visual thinking kinesthetic thinking right and and, and all, all this so again it's important to know how they think and you the means to sort of cover this, right? I mean, uh, which are most suitable for this particular child. Uh, and what is interesting about perceptual thinking, it's not only about visual, whatever, special as well. And special is not necessarily visual, by the way. It can be special visual, right? And we know many autistic people are good at it, but special, uh, not necessarily visual. By the way, when uh, I, I, my, my thinking is special and I, I, I can't put in words because I can't describe pictures, there are no pictures. It's like <laughs> uh, I can see structures, okay, but not visual structures. Uh, you see, when I'm planning a book, this is the best example. Uh, when I am planning a book, uh, I don't plan, you know, like this chapter, that chapter. No, I, I plan it in my head as a structure okay and it can be you know all sort of structure and no pictures but it's structure and then i can sort of move different yeah <laughs> things around you see and no words no but i know what i am moving uh, i can't explain but but again this type of thinking also exists that's what i'm trying to say and another feature of perceptual thinking uh, and autistic uh, thinking is associ uh, associative thinking. Yeah. As associative me memory and associative thinking. Uh, and it's like uh, when you start thinking about something and talking and suddenly any word can trigger you and send you in the, a different direction. You know, it's, it's like... Uh, and. Uh, then another word again to some somewhere else somewhere else and then you are lost what i was talking about yeah. it happens to me all the time i talk and then suddenly i, I look at something oh gosh i have to do it and i forgot the place 
where uh, what I was uh, was talking, and uh, memory is also very important. Uh, many autistic people, while uh, remembering something, they re-experience it. Yeah. Whether it is visually or multisensory or it is auditory and whatever, they don't, uh, like uh, non-artistic memory, uh, it works like, first I did this, then I went there, you know, just a linear memory, right? Yeah. And you can change it, you can sort of tell lies because you can sort of add something that never happened or remove something that have Autistic memory is very different. Uh, it's the whole memory as one unit. That's why they find so difficult to answer questions like, uh, what did you do today? You know, it's just, yeah, it's so difficult to find, yeah. you, you know, it's just, that's why it's better to ask. Okay. Uh, this communication book between school and uh, parents is very good, yeah. where a teacher writes what happened at school. And then if you ask the right question, because some parents say, uh, you always say that memory is um, sort of very good in autism. It is. They remember everything. And uh, why my child cannot answer something like, what did you do at school today? Because their memory works like this. If you look, for example, oh, you went shopping today with Simon. What did you buy? And the child will recite a shopping list. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you trigger this memory and he will tell you the price or something what ha that happened in the shop. You see, so this is important to remember. Uh, they, uh, they remember the whole situation as one entity. Okay. And it's impossible to change it because it is there. You know, it, 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 is, it is there. So this is uh, important. And another thing, anything can trigger a memory. Yeah. The problem is uh, like with unknown knowing, right? Subconsciously, they remember a lot, but the access to the memory uh, is very difficult. It's only savants, you know, autistic savants, they yeah. can privilege access to this memory. Uh, uh, others, they need triggers to provide some unknown knowing, to answer the question they didn't know they know the answer to. Okay. And anything can trigger not only positive memories, but negative memories. Okay. And what it means is, they will remember not only what happens, they will re-experience how they felt. And if it, if it was really a bad feeling, they will recreate it. Because the past memory becomes very present. If you're re-experiencing everything, you, you, you are making it present. And that is why, you know, this ABC approach, yeah. when we analyze challenging behavior, antecedent beha behavior consequence, yeah. do you use it? I have used it in the past, yes. Does it work? Not always. Uh, do you yeah. agree with this? Yeah. Because see, it's not so easy to find this antecedent yeah. because sometimes it can be something that is, uh, what, they and can see no 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 yes you cannot hear and they can and something you are deaf to yeah. can trigger their challenging behavior right yeah. so antecedent present but invisible let us yeah. call it this yeah. or there is past antecedent if something triggers the memory the child will react yeah. where is the trigger where is antecedent in the past and if you cannot connect it, if you don't know this, sometimes people say it's out of the blue. Nothing is out yeah. of the blue in autism, just nothing. Then there is probable future antecedent, right? That, for example, children can break telephone. My son did this once uh, at school because phones can uh, unexpect, unexpectedly uh, ring, right? Yeah. And any sudden unpredictable stimulus could so they can break it now just to, to feel safe later right yeah. or my son couldn't tolerate babies crying when he was younger he couldn't 
he was jumping out of his skin when he, you know, his protective strategy was. Because of course I did everything not to take him to the park, for example, if I heard babies or saw mothers with babies. But the problem was he would hit the baby even if the baby is asleep. So, and the babies are everywhere. Why? Because babies are unpredictable. Yeah. To protect himself. Uh, ah, and if they are prepared for this unpleasant stimuli, they feel better. Yeah. So to protect himself, he would start this, you know, just hit the baby. Now, desensitization and everything, he still finds it unpleasant, but of course, no accidents whatsoever. Yeah. But at the time, it was difficult. Again, it is antecedent, okay, which is impossible to find. Then we talked about it when it is us our emotional state they that triggers the behaviors yeah. right because they cannot distinguish between their own feelings and our feelings they feel it physically in their bodies yeah. then it can be synesthesia as well yeah. because some word can pr produce some sort of pictures in their heads and uh, they don't like it so uh, then it can be last straw antecedent when the child is tired already and of course, anything can trigger. So there, there are so many things which should be taken into account when you sort of prepare something for uh, children uh, to take them somewhere or whatever. So it's important to know. Yes. Do you think, Olga, that with regards to those um, those ABC charts? No, I, I, as I said, I've used them in the past, um, but I would be very far like I very firmly believe um, I suppose as I've moved forward as a parent um, that we look at what's going on in the very moment and that's it and that we look and we we do our best to proactively um, support the child looking at their their sensory profile and looking at whether or not they present as hyper or hypo sensitive or whether or not they in fact present as both at different times during the day and so on and so forth and make sure that we've got a toolbox of strategies that um, with us at all times. And all what a long question, uh, you lost me. Sorry, no, I, I suppose I'm just wondering, Olga, um, with regards to the, instead of using those antecedent uh, behaviour, those ABC charts, would it make more sense to proactively prepare um, a toolbox, that, uh, a toolbox of sensory strategies of to meet the needs of the autistic person, of course. be they hyper or hyposensitive at any time during the day? Yes, but again, please don't limit it to hyper and hypo. We yeah, talked about absolutely. it already. It's yeah. much more to that, of course. Absolutely. Because see, I, I don't say ABC is a bad approach. Yeah. It doesn't work all the time. Yeah. It's not a, about being good or bad. It's not criticism. Yeah. I'm just trying to show that it doesn't work all the time. Yeah. Okay, yes. Understanding your child's sensory profile will help a lot. Yeah. You know, that's why we have no uh, accident at home. I mean, now we had, in the past we did, we did. And you know, there are good days and bad days as always. But anyway, it's uh, very, very different now when we, I don't know, we feel each other. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, easy. and I, that's, I, I suppose, um, I know that I'm, I'm doing a little bit of work at the moment um, with, uh, within in residential in residence uh, residential settings, um, and I find that there's a lot of looking at the kind of the antecedent and looking for that antecedent and stuff, and um, people are forgetting about those proactive sensory tools. Yes, you see, when you get some sort of mm, this uh, table questionnaire, whatever. Yes, it is useful, or this antecedent, whatever, you know, or you have to fill in this form, what causes this, yeah. what the, it limits you in, yeah. some, in, in your imagination, if you like, right? You stop thinking, what else could have happened? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've got this, you know, prescribed, rigid stuff. It is useful, I'm not saying it is not, right? But still, don't limit your observation sure. by this and you you see think more about yeah. what you can do to avoid this or whatever because see i don't know i know now where it is safe to take him where not but i've made so many mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes you can't avoid it i'm no, you know Absolutely. you can't avoid them Absolutely. learn from these mistakes and and move on yeah. because i know because okay 
life is life. Exactly. I suppose life always gets in the way, doesn't it? And life <coughs> tends to teach us lessons that we mm-hmm. that we need to know, really. Mm-hmm. And can I ask you, Olga, how did you find your experience as a parent of two autistic individuals has influenced the way you look at the condition as a whole? Oh, first, as I said, uh, they are so different. Yeah. <laughs> the approaches uh, I use are the opposite sometimes. Yeah. What is good for one will be, oh, oh don't you even dare do this to, yeah. to the other. You know what I mean? And now, as so much more is known about autism, and still, we don't, uh, the more we know, the more we understand and how little we know it's, uh, it's of course but still now more and more researchers say it's not uh, autism uh, a disorder autistic disorder it's a group of autistic disorders okay it's a heter- heterogeneous uh, condition different in kind yes a lot of overlap right yes. but still you see and now uh, many researchers looking for phenotypes or subgroups in sensory, even in sensory. <clears throat> Let us take this. Again, five children in your classroom. Uh, and uh, one of them, uh, no, uh, three are hypersensitive to light, yes. two hyposensitive. Can you imagine your day? Three wanting lights on, two lights off, fighting, screaming, challenging behavior. Just if you start grouping children like this, they belong to different subgroups. They are autistic. They are autistic, but they belong to different subgroups. Because if you put these children into one classroom because they are autistic, I can promise their teacher will will soon look for another place of employment. It is impossible to accommodate. So different people you know all this well-known saying uh if you know one autistic child you know one autistic child but you have to work with several and if we won't differentiate between these uh autistic subgroups we won't be able to help anyone yeah and another thing is oh my favorite donna williams you know how she called autism in her latest book she can because i think we we don't have autism we have autisms yeah okay and she compared autism to a fruit salad yeah yeah more bananas in this one more apples in that, yeah. that one you see a lot in common but very different and that is why for me the phrase we autistics is meaningless which part of we are we anyway and that's why see it is important if you're trying to help we have to help everyone right yeah. and that's why we have to find this and it's a pity that asperger's syndrome was removed okay. we put everything into one basket yeah. i th- thought it was very good that because asperger's syndrome are different yeah. you know what i mean Yes, it is on the spectrum. It's not a problem, but they are different. So it's better to know each child and then decide with these children, I can do this. And for these children, this will be necessary. Yeah. You know, not just consider them. They are all autistic. Now, my, my attitude to autism, uh, my, uh, <clears throat> another definition of autism, it is from Switzerland, Swiss researchers, Mark Ram. It is uh, the intense world syndrome. I love it. Their research shows, they, they did a lot of research. It was 1997 or something. Yes, 1997. Uh, what the conclusion, okay? It is brain research. I'm not qualified to talk about brain. I don't want to make any mistakes. But the conclusion was autistic people perceive too much, think too much, and feel too much and remember too much. It is all too much, you see? And that's because their senses work in overdrive. They are too open or overloaded all the time. And that is why they have different uh, trajectory of language development, cognition and behaviors. It's not cognitive and then sensory starts sort of, no, 
it's because their senses work differently, their perceptual processes are very different, of course, they impact on cognitive processes like memory, thinking, and language development. For me, it is so logical. It's logical what is going on. And another thing is, uh, as I said in the very beginning, is for me, uh, when I learned that my son was autistic, I was very happy because I knew the name. Yeah. For me, whatever my son had <laughs> would be great if I know how I can help him. Yeah. Does it make sense? Absolutely. And to know whatever it is helped me so much to help my son and my daughter. Yeah. Because for me, my children, the best what happened to me in my both lives, you know? Yeah. It's just the best. I, I, and as a bonus, as I said, I learned a lot about myself. Yeah. Absolutely. And thanks God, I didn't stay the way I was. Thanks God nobody told me stay the way you are because I changed. I'm more patient now, much more patient, more thinking, more feeling, if you like, right? More empathizing, sort of it's very different. And the best description of autism comes from my daughter. I have to tell you this. And this is the best attitude, I think. And uh, She's uh, once I remember she it was her birthday, she was 15, now she's 29. Why I remember that it was her birthday, I was invited to York, uh, to the York University to, go, to give a lecture for occupational uh, therapists in the university. And as it was 15th of May, I said, No, 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 it's my daughter's birthday, my children are my priority. But then she said, Mom, let's go together together we, we love york it's not far from where i live and then we will celebrate my birthday in york and this was the first time she heard me talking okay. because she never uh, attend actually she was at school and she was sitting at the last desk it was a huge lecture theater and sort of i was talking telling them and she was listening it was so interesting she was interested in all this at the end there were question times and many questions, okay, I love questions. And then one student asked, uh, can I ask your daughter a question? Can you imagine? We never discussed autism at home. Why discuss it? We never, you know, autism, you know, autistic, what they know about it. But I, I didn't expect it. And I wanted to say, well, no, my daughter was marching to the stage, <laughs> you know, yes, please. And then they, uh, she asked the question, the student, and my heart just fell. <laughs> uh, please tell me, what is it like to live with a severely autistic brother? I couldn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was paralyzed and I thought, how can I help you to get out of the situation? I was sort of, my, my, my thoughts were running. And my, my clever girl, she said it, and I couldn't say it better. You know, 15 year old teenager. Yeah. What do you mean what it is like? It is normal. I loved it. And that is why, what, see, it, it was, I, I couldn't say it better. Yeah. It is autism and what? Yes, and it is normal. I, why should we, so this is my attitude to autism. Fantastic. Yeah, it happened. My family is, and what? Yeah. We are dealing with it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I suppose from one parent to another, Olga, I know that um, in a previous lifetime, I would have worked in childcare and in special ed and, and so on and so forth. And then I had my family and so on. Um, and I will say that my, my parental experience has placed me on um, a very different path, but it definitely has, um, it has enriched my life a hundred mm -hmm. million times fold. Do you know what I mean? And I wouldn't ever choose to be anywhere. Of course not. Right no, of course not. Do you know? Uh, of course not. You know, and um, I will tell you again uh, the last bit because it is important, I think. You see, my son's IQ was assessed. I disagreed with this. It, in England, he was about 11 or 12. Uh, yes, a, a lot of akalalia, but he could read and write, and he was bilingual. He understood two languages. Yeah. Can you imagine? Severely. 
autistic child. Anyway, and his IQ, the psychologist came here and uh, nonverbal IQ, he started whatever. And uh, he, he refused to cooperate. I could see he can do it. Yeah. He did it when he was three. Yeah. Oh no, but as he was not cooperative, his IQ was assessed less than 40. And then I said, let us try his verbal skills because he is bilingual. No, it's, there is no point. Anyway, you can imagine what I thought about this assessment on yeah. psychologists, but it was so long ago. And now I had done so much research and I've come to a conclusion. You know, when we talk about autistic intelligence, um, yeah. autistic intelligence is described in, as something they can do better than non-autistic people. Uh, using these IQ tests and some tests they d do better, much better than uh, non-autistic people. But <clears throat> I don't think it is, no, okay, it is autistic intelligent, but it's not the main point because this, this IQ tests were developed for non-autistic population okay. to see whether they are delayed in their development or not, right? Yeah. But in autism, the, the the cognition, you know, everything is so different. And they can do what we not only cannot do, we cannot even imagine they can do it. Yeah. And we cannot assess it because we don't know this exists. Yeah. There are no, and I can tell you, I worked, especially with nonverbal people, uh, it's, it's just unbelievable how intelli autistically intelligent they are. Okay, and hopefully one day we will learn more because I am doing so much research on this now. And I, I love this. Uh, I think, again, it was Jasmine O'Neill and Donna Williams, they talk about it. Jasmine O'Neill, a nonverbal lady. Uh, they said, you would be, uh, it's not a quote, I don't remember uh, the wording. You would be um, considered idiots in autistic world. It's not only, but this is true. <clears throat> yes, yeah, yeah. yes, this is absolutely true. Because see, uh, let us place you uh, sort of, you know, to the environment where elephants live and leave you there, whatever. Who will be cleverer? Whose intelligence will, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So in autistic world, non-autistic people will be assessed as severely, absolutely. mentally retarded. Yeah. I use the past terminology. My son was diagnosed with this and I disagree and I think you agree with my disagreement, okay? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important, Alba, that people start realizing that there are so many more intelligent <laughs> people, this academic intelligence or this linguistic intelligence, whatever, that, that there are so many different strengths and different talents that people bring to the table and we just, we don't hold enough, we don't allow uh, there to be enough waiting in them. I have a young person here who is driving machines in our, in like our, around our house. So, like he's been able to drive machines since he was like five with his dad sitting beside him. Mm -hmm. He can now, as an older teenager, park um, a giant truck to within a, 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 about an inch of where it needs to be parked. There are grown men who have been driving trucks for 20 and 13, 40 years who don't have that level of skill. Um, but there's no marker for that level of skill in any academic setting. Yeah. Do you know? Yes. And you know, sometimes my son surprises me. You see, I, I never thought he would do something and he does. Yeah. Uh, and I go, gosh, how does he know? Yeah. You know, yeah. no. And they, uh, so for me, autistic intelligence, it's not what we measure IQ and there's, yeah. they are better. Yes, they are. But it doesn't mean that, you know, for me, what autistic intelligence is what we cannot do at all, non-autistic people, and what they can do better, but we cannot even imagine what they can do. Absolutely. Like, see, uh, <clears throat> we cannot appreciate this intelligence. I know um, the environment, our culture is not sort of prepared for this because we don't know it exists. It's like uh, if uh, you are colorblind and you cannot see the red color and you look at the red, throws how can you appreciate the beauty of the flower yeah right yeah sort of if we cannot see it we, we, we sort of it doesn't exist and i think it's very very wrong yeah 
you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, Olga, you'll be glad to know there's only a few questions left. Um, I suppose, first and foremost, where can people go to get more information on you? Now, I know you don't have a website. <laughs> no, I don't. No. <laughs> no, I don't. Perhaps one day. I, I don't know. No, no, I, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm useless with this. But Facebook and LinkedIn um, sort of this is the way to find out because I post it is like I post mostly about autism it is research papers uh, like abstracts yeah. of uh, the most recent research which I think people will find interesting right and some posts and whatever so it is a professional connection I mean LinkedIn and Facebook there are a couple of um, personal pictures me and children and that is it on holiday when we are on holiday but otherwise it is autism related it is like my uh, website sorry okay, no I, think I know I think see i'm very get somebody old somebody to organize that website Olga. yeah i'm very old-fashioned like you know last century dinosaur i know still still you have to that's something that your daughter can get on the case for you now yeah perhaps yeah, she will right. yeah. definitely um Olga, can i ask you are you in the process of working on any other books or papers that people should keep an eye out on uh, at the moment yes now i mean um, now i'm you see sensory perceptual issues i show i showed you right yeah. because revisions are necessary much more research and much yeah. more information and now i i'm revising my second book communication wow. issues and autism so don't buy it okay. <laughs> i'm revising it because uh, it was written about 18 15 years ago of course there is so much more and i'm working on it and it will be completely revised Fantastic. and Fantastic. Uh, and of course i'm working i mentioned it on my uh, second <laughs> second book in this series for uh, European countries Perfect. Perfect. and I am with my son <laughs> in in lockdown you know yeah I know the feeling I know the feeling <laughs> Um, what was I going to say, Olga, with regards to um, your your second, the, 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 the book, the first book that you just showed me there, the, the, this one. the, the communication, the, the, yeah, that one. Um, when do you anticipate the revised uh, edition of that? Uh, I will finish uh, by February next week uh, because it's, uh, there is so much. It's still, if, if somebody can um, sort of take it in the libraries, there is still a lot of useful information, but there will be much more. There will be additional information. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I suppose last question if you, Algo, just before we finish up, though, just to let people know that you will be um, you will be speaking at this year's Cork Autism Conference and that that's on the 11th of October. I know you were due to come over to Cork, but that now you are going to be presenting online. Um, I have my ticket purchased. I can't wait to, to hear all that, you, uh, that you're going to share on the day. I know that you've said that a lot of what we're going to do, what, that what we've spoken about today, that you will be discussing some of that much yeah. more detail at the conference. Is that correct? Yes, yes, it will be about communication and language, yes. Perfect, perfect. So I suppose your final question, Olga, is from your experience as both a parent in a neurodiverse household and a professional in the autism field, what is the most important piece of advice you could give my listeners to help them navigate their own, uh, their own or their children's autism journey? Uh, you know, what, what is important for parents to remember this is the most beautiful child, the best ever you've got. One child, two children, three, it doesn't matter. And remember, you, your emotions will be up and down. Yeah. First, it will be, oh, terrible, I don't know anything. And we all are developing all the time. Yeah. Yes, you will feel grief, perhaps some will no problem take your time but not too long because you have to to help your son or daughter or both because see remember and uh, for those who work with parents right please remember if parents are difficult it's because they want to help their children yeah, absolutely. yes of course you don't have enough resources you don't have enough whatever to be honest they do not care it is about their children 
and they will fight for them. And this is good. So take your time, whatever, and develop further. And see, in my experience, difficult children produce difficult parents who prepare to do anything and everything, but educate themselves as well, because only you can help them to find their place in the world. And by the way, they will help you to define yourself. As one philosopher said, what? Know thyself. And sometimes it takes a lifetime. So you will learn a lot about yourself as well. I that is beautiful, it. Beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you. Perhaps I was all over the place, but I can't talk without movement. I'm so sorry. Absolutely perfect. Thank you so, so much, Olga. Okay, thank you.